Most people wonder whether deeply toxic and troubled individuals, such as psychopaths and sociopaths, can be rehabilitated through any form of therapy. Both criminal psychopaths and those who do not commit crimes can exhibit deeply troubling behaviors, but many of us cling to the belief that there is good in everyone and that anyone can change with the right help. But what do studies say about this? Is there any evidence that treating a psychopath with therapeutic means can improve their behavior? There is very little evidence that therapy or any attempt at rehabilitation has a positive impact on psychopaths. In fact, research data seemingly indicate that attempts to treat and reform psychopaths actually worsen their destructive and criminal behavior. This will be confirmed by anyone who has experienced a psychopath in their daily life. No appeals to humanity, decency, or morality compel them to change their destructive behavior. However, this does not mean that they cannot think rationally, but with a life concept that cannot provide them with immutable moral principles, all societal values will be irrelevant. From all the research, it is evident that psychopaths demonstrate a predictable pattern of physical and psychological destructiveness towards others, which remains unchanged throughout their lives. These toxic traits never leave them. It seems they are simply stuck as they are. Let's examine the reasons for this more closely, as well as summarize what research conducted on this issue has shown. From a technical standpoint, the prognosis for psychopathy is very poor. In other words, little can be done to change or improve the condition after diagnosis. There is no evidence that they can be successfully treated or cured. It seems they are just as they are. Psychopaths remain entirely unresponsive to any form of negative reinforcement, punishment, in other words, attempting to shape or change a psychopath by punishing bad behavior does nothing to alter them. They just continue as they are. This is unsurprising when we understand that psychopaths lack the same filters or moral compass that normal people have. They do not understand that some things are acceptable while others are not. They are not concerned with morals or values. They may have an intellectual understanding that other people consider certain things right or wrong, but they lack that internal moral barometer. There is some evidence that psychopaths respond minimally to positive reinforcement. In other words, providing rewards for good behavior seems to reinforce this behavior in them. This is at best a very weak way of managing their condition, and it is not a cure. Their fundamental malignancy remains exactly the same. Part of what makes treating psychopathy so difficult is that we simply do not yet fully understand where it comes from. The root causes of the condition are still unknown, as researchers are still debating whether it is dependent on genetic or environmental factors, or a combination of both. The lack of understanding of where psychopathy originates or how it forms makes successful treatment very challenging, even if we assume it can be treated at all. The only certainty is that currently nothing seems to work in treating psychopathy, even slightly. A study by Rice, Harris, and Cormier in 1992, where they examined the effect of therapy on the rate of recidivism, repeat offenses, among violent psychopaths. They found that the rates of recidivism among violent psychopaths who received therapy were actually higher than those in control groups where there was no therapy. Attempts to use therapy for their treatment made them more likely to re-offend after release, not less likely. Anyone who has observed the lives of non-violent psychopaths in everyday life will also find this trait. Appealing to an internal moral compass that exists in humans from birth and goes through stages of development as they mature will be futile. But still, we do not depart from the paradigm of materialism to use only the factor of intuitive morality. It is entirely possible to influence such a person with a narrative about the existence of an afterlife, which instills fear in every human being. In fact, they simply pick up the jargon, 
or emotional terms that they hear others use and absorb them so as not to change their fundamental nature, but simply manipulate others even more effectively in the future. As they pass through their victims, psychopaths often refine and improve their actions and facade to more easily and convincingly deceive others. They pick up certain therapeutic and emotional jargon they hear along the way from people trying to reform or change them, and simply parrot that jargon when it suits them to present a more convincing side of emotional literacy and intelligence. They use it as a manipulative tool and do not care about growth, changes, or reforms for themselves. As if any attempt to change a psychopath makes them more determined to be who they are. This leads to the idea that psychopathy and evil in general are acts of free will and choice, not the randomness of genetics or fate. Psychopathy deliberately remains as it is and actively resists any efforts to try to change them. So what can be done with psychopaths? Given this extremely poor prognosis for treating psychopaths through therapy or any other means, how does this change how we approach them, both in the criminal justice system and in everyday life? In the case of violent offenders diagnosed as psychopaths, this has serious implications for whether they should be released at all, especially for more serious crimes. If they remain the same throughout their lives and any attempts to reform or treat them make them worse, should they ever be released again? If evidence suggests that something can be done, many simply repeat the offense and cause more harm to others. And since there is no prospect of reform or change, there are strong arguments that they should never be released as they are unwilling to change. This draws a sharper focus when we see that the proportion of psychopaths responsible for crime, despite constituting only about 1% of the general population and about 15-20% of the prison population. As with any other human interactions, psychopaths view therapy with a cool detachedness, going through the motions, telling partners and therapists what they want to hear about growth, changes, and repentance, but at a basic level, nothing changes in their personality. Even in therapy, they are constantly manipulating. Thus, even with non-violent psychopaths you deal with in the external world, the general conclusion remains the same as with a criminal psychopath in prison. Attempts to make them change through therapy or any other means won't work. In one study, differences in the brains of criminals who were imprisoned after committing the worst types of crimes were examined. Before the study, the inmates completed the Hare Psychopathy Checklist. This is an industry standard test that asks questions to determine if a person has psychopathic tendencies. Another study scanned the brains of inmates who scored high for psychopathy on the same checklist. The studies identified significant differences in these areas in the brains of psychopaths, amygdala, prefrontal cortex, paralimbic structures, ventral striatum. So why are these specific areas important when it comes to psychopathic behavior? The amygdala is our emotional center. It is responsible for perceiving our primary emotions such as fear, anger, sadness, love, as well as controlling our impulses and aggression. The amygdala is also a key part of our learning processes. It teaches us about the society we live in. In other words, acceptable rules and boundaries. Additionally, it enhances what is dangerous and helps us recognize threats and dangers. In the study, psychopaths were shown a series of distressing images. Some of them depicted frightened faces, others depicted moral violations. In the psychopath's brain, activity in the amygdala significantly decreased when they looked at distressing images. This means that psychopaths have not learned to live within the bounds of social rules. They do not recognize normal etiquette or boundaries. Seeing frightened people does not bother them. Reduced activity in the amygdala also affects the weakening of the fear response. Furthermore, our emotional response to fear in other people is also diminished. 
The study showed that the higher the participants scored on the hair checklist, the lower the activity in the amygdala. Function of the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex controls impulses, planning, decision-making, self-control, and both short-term and long-term decision-making. This area is responsible for high-level functions that help to implement important areas of activity. To give you an idea of the damage the prefrontal cortex can cause, one well-known case is that of Phineas Gage. Gage suffered devastating trauma from an iron rod piercing his brain in the area of the prefrontal cortex. His personality changed dramatically overnight. Before the accident, Gage was gentle, hardworking, and a loving husband. Afterward, he became cruel, aggressive, abusive, and callous. Research has shown that psychopaths have much less gray matter in the region of the prefrontal cortex called the orbitofrontal cortex, OFC. The OFC is believed to be involved in impulse control and decision-making. It is also important in the association of reward. The prefrontal cortex controls our behavior. It serves as our brakes, controlling our impulses and preventing us from doing whatever we want. Normal people might think, I want to kill my boss. He's so stupid. But we never dream of acting on our thoughts because we know it's wrong and our actions have consequences. Imagine if we had no control or breaks on our thoughts. Any impairment in this area will lead to a person acting without consequences. Conversely, this area is activated and lights up when a psychopath watches someone being hurt or punished. Function of the Paralimbic Structures The paralimbic structures are responsible for memory and memorization. They control our short-term and episodic memory. But what does this mean in real life? I always use this as an example to describe episodic memory. My episodic memory recalls a sports day at school when I won second prize for the 400 meters. The limbic system is also closely linked to the amygdala, which regulates emotions and emotions are closely linked to memories. So what does this have to do with psychopaths? The brains of psychopaths show a significant reduction in volume in the paralimbic system. The decrease in this area is associated with disruptions in recalling episodic memories. But why is this important? If you can't remember what happened in your own past, you might recall it differently than how it actually happened. You might see your role in the experience as more important and others as weaker. Function of the ventral striatum The ventral striatum is responsible for processing reward and motivation. This area controls anticipation, decision-making, and the outcomes of rewards. This area is associated with instant gratification or immediate receipt. In a study, Inmates with the highest activity in the ventral stripe also scored high in psychopathy. This indicates that they overvalue immediate rewards and cannot wait for delayed ones. Furthermore, the study showed a weakened connection between the ventral striatum and the prefrontal cortex area. This area is responsible for our ability to mentally travel through time and look into the future. People with normal brains can anticipate the consequences of our actions. Psychopaths cannot do this. We need the prefrontal cortex to make prospective judgments about how an action will affect us in the future. If I do this, then this bad thing will happen. We think about it so that if you sever this link with someone, they will start making bad choices because they won't have the information that otherwise would have guided their decision-making toward more adaptive goals. Backholtz If a psychopath's brain is different, shouldn't we treat them differently? If someone suffered a traumatic brain injury and then committed a crime, we wouldn't send them to prison. So why do we continue to incarcerate psychopaths when we know their brains don't function like ordinary ones? Backholtz wants society to see psychopaths the same way we see other people with poor impulse control and decision-making. He wants us to see them as people with brain deficits who need our help. Unfortunately, it may take a long time before we can do that.
In reality, there is no official diagnosis of psychopath. These are terms the public will use to report behavioral symptoms that someone experiences. Psychopathy refers to what is known as antisocial personality disorder. APD is one of the four personality disorders that belong to cluster B personality disorders. The others are borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and histrionic personality disorder. APD is typically considered the worst of the provided variations because it has some traits present in other disorders but still suffers from antisocial personality disorder. APD manifests differently in individuals. It's easier for us to think of psychopathy as the end result or product of physical issues combined with environmental problems. Now, to understand what physically happens in the psychopath's brain, we need to discuss a neurotransmitter called serotonin. Serotonin is a monoamine neurotransmitter. When active, it either initiates or halts the onset of a signal or alters the function of another signal. When serotonin is released into the synapse, it first leaves the presynaptic neuron. Then serotonin enters the space between neurons, called the synaptic cleft, and then binds to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. Depending on the location and type of neuron, serotonin either initiates, suppresses, or alters activity in the synapse. The activity of this enzyme is encoded by a DNA sequence called the MAOA gene, located on the X chromosome. There are different variants of this gene, such as MAOAH or MAOAL, indicating high or low gene activity. Some researchers have found that most psychopaths have a low-functioning variant of the AMAOA gene. Is this a problem at all, considering serotonin is the happiness neurotransmitter? From this perspective, its dominance would be preferable. Looking at selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they work by limiting the amount of serotonin reuptake into the presynaptic neuron. Neurotransmitters are never solely responsible. Dopamine isn't responsible for joy or pleasure, and serotonin isn't responsible for happiness. They play a role in this behavior and movements by working with other hormones and neurotransmitters. You might think we've found the relevant fact for understanding behavioral structure, assuming this is the gene responsible for aggression. It's now just a matter of cutting it out using genetic engineering and will no longer have serial killers. The problem is that it's absolutely not the case because emotions and behavior are very complex aspects. Violent behavior may be catalyzed by the environment, causing devastation through traumatic experience, such as sexual violence, cruel treatment by parents, or witnessing horrifying things, which could be enough to lean the scales toward psychopathy. Trauma can be devastating at any age, but childhood trauma is particularly destructive. Returning to the areas of the prefrontal cortex, sending a signal to the DLPFC. Even if you don't have the MAOAL gene and altered brain structures, but you're young and experience childhood trauma, it may be enough to shift the DLPFC, causing aberrations from other areas, becoming low functioning. We get the same type of result as with psychopathy, but this time it's entirely based on the environment. Considering that psychopaths and sociopaths are related to antisocial personality disorder, they will have several common behavior patterns, and one of them will be a complete lack of empathy. In most cases, it is physically impossible for them to put themselves in another's shoes. They also lack a sense of concern. Their heart rate doesn't race like other people's. Instead, they tend to gravitate towards positions of power, sometimes becoming serial killers, but in other cases, they may become lawyers or doctors, enjoying this position of power and manipulation. Likewise, they often become CEOs. Statistically, a large number of CEOs are psychopaths. When you lack empathy, you don't worry. This gives confidence for risk-taking. 
A notorious moment in psychopathic neurobiology history occurred in 2006 when scientist James Fallon was sifting through a stack of PET scans. Fallon had been studying the neuroanatomical basis of psychopathy for some time, and he began to understand well what brain activity would signal these tendencies. On his desk, among the brain scans of killers, depressives, and schizophrenics, were scans of him and his family, as part of a separate study on Alzheimer's disease. I got to the bottom of the stack and saw this scan that was clearly pathological, Fallon said in an interview with the Smithsonian Institute. Looking at the code behind the scans, he discovered that he was actually looking at his own brain. Fallon's research then turned inward and he continued to explore several neurological and genetic markers that correlate with psychopathic tendencies. People's attention, but they might also get upset about. And here is a psychopath where all of the, here up in the frontal lobe and what's called the interior cingulate uh, is turned off. Fallon's personal connection to psychopathy also led him to investigate the strange interplay of nature and nurture that ultimately leads a psychopath to express themselves through violent antisocial behavior. Ultimately, if his brain resembled that of a psychopath, what separated him from a cruel psychopathic criminal? This example can be illustrated as not all aspects of life, human nature, psyche, and mind are reflected in the brain structure or directly related to it. Analogous to a faulty radio, it is not the source of the announcer's voice. As our society seems structured to reward the type of ruthless behavior, which is perfectly illustrated by psychopathy, it is not surprising that some studies have shown that up to one in five corporate professionals exhibit clinically significant psychopathic traits. One of the main psychopathic characteristics that many scientists typically focus on is a noticeable lack of empathy, with victims seemingly demonstrating a significant inability to emotionally connect with other people. A study conducted by the Royal College in 2012 found that male violent criminals diagnosed with psychopathy showed significantly reduced volumes of gray matter in the anterior rostral prefrontal cortex and temporal poles. This remarkable and specific structural anomaly in part of the brain associated with empathy and guilt suggests a clear neurological difference between ordinary violent offenders and true psychopaths. However, a direct lack of empathy is not enough to make someone a full-fledged psychopath. In the end, not all those who exhibit psychopathic characteristics turn out to be cruel criminals. Dr. James Fallon can attest to that. So what else is happening inside the brain to compel a psychopath to make antisocial decisions? One 2016 study found no difference in ventral striatum excitability between criminal and non-criminal psychopaths when playing a reward game. However, a significant difference between the two groups was detected in the connectivity of the ventral striatum and another brain area called the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex. This brain area is known to govern cognitive control of behavior, performance regulation, impulse control, and overall self-restraint. High psychopathic offenders showed abnormally high connectivity between the ventral striatum, controlling behavior, and the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, controlling behavior. These observations raise the hypothesis that psychopathic offenders may exhibit an inability to adjust performance due to aberrant reward anticipation. In addition to the reassessment of reward signals from the ventral striatum, a recent Harvard study has shown that individuals with psychopathy cannot accurately assess the future consequences of their actions. In this MRI study, 49 inmates were examined, and a weak correlation was found between the ventral striatum and ventromedial prefrontal cortex in inmates with high psychopathic tendencies. These scientific findings leave us in a strange and contradictory position. Psychopathic tendencies clearly do not necessarily lead to criminal or antisocial behavior. Rather, 
it seems that a more complex set of neurological conditions leads to the actual expression of psychopathy in negative, antisocial, or criminal actions. Lack of empathy, excessive reward, and inability to assess future consequences, all of these lead to decision-making that normal people classify as psychopathic. The legal and social implications of this research are troubling for many. If we can classify criminal or abhorrent behavior as simply a neurological dysfunction, then our entire basis for holding legal responsibility collapses. Intent is currently a crucial aspect in establishing judgment in our legal system. The emerging field of neurolaw is grappling with this very issue as neuroscientific means of defense become increasingly evident in courtrooms. One intriguing 2012 study showed that judges tend to be more lenient when presented with a neurobiological cause of psychopathy. It is implied that the individual is somewhat less personally culpable in these cases. We could call this the defense of my brain made me do it. We may have conscious control over our choices, but it is becoming increasingly apparent that there are numerous neurological mechanisms that influence how we evaluate information guiding our decisions. Psychopathy is currently not officially classified as a mental disorder, but some scientists argue that it should be, as the underlying neural dysfunction of this disorder has been clearly identified. This growing field of neurology of psychopathy not only helps us understand why some people do terrible things, but also sheds light on why we all do what we do. The most striking idea is that if we can pinpoint how a certain brain area can lead to criminal or antisocial behavior, then the flip side is that we must also link altruistic or selfless actions to similar neurological functions. In conclusion, based on this data, we can draw several conclusions. Not all mental processes are directly linked to brain structure. It is also worth understanding that although psychopaths cannot appeal to the intuitive morality inherent in humans from birth and develop throughout their socialization process, they can still act according to rational thinking. The argument about punishment in the afterlife as well as the idea of the transience of this world followed by calculation on Judgment Day, can act as a limiting factor in the desire for violence expression, unlike the ideologies of materialism, liberalism, and hedonism, which, on the contrary, proclaim the idea of maximizing pleasure, serving as an additional trigger for such individuals to realize their criminal plans.